I will. Okay, we are now live and um, we are also now recording. Uh, well, I guess we should go ahead and get started then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Alvarez, co-chair of the uh, Housing and Land Use Committee. We're meeting this evening and we have a pretty full program. Um, and so we should probably go ahead and get started. So uh, on behalf of my co-chair, Talisha Sainville, who will also be joining us shortly, um, we'll go ahead and um, get into our first agenda item tonight, um, which will be presented by NHS Brooklyn or Neighborhood Housing Services Brooklyn. Uh, we have here this evening uh, Tyrone McDonald, uh, who is the Government and Community Relations Manager of NHS Brooklyn. And uh, a little bit later, we'll also have Byron Todman, who's a program manager of housing development, rehab, and property management, uh, to provide a presentation this evening to talk about NHS Brooklyn's programs, services, and resources uh, for homeowners, landlords, and tenants. So without further ado, uh, without further ado, Mr. McDonald, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to get us started this evening. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Alvarez. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, once again, my name is Tyrone McDonald, um, and I'm the Government Community Relations Manager of Neighborhood Housing Services of Brooklyn. Um, I know um, some of you are actually um, I, uh, not strangers, and, and some of you um, probably uh, see me for the first time. Um, I just want to welcome you, and um, just to get it into a little bit about Neighborhood Housing Services, I'm going to share my screen. And at any moment, um, my colleague will be dropping in, colleague, but um, share. Okay. Okay. So neighborhood housing services, who we are, right? Um, a lot of times, given our name, it has the word housing. We are often confused with being a part of NYCHA, which is understandable, all right? Because NYCHA, um, New York City is actually is the largest, um, has the largest um, number of um, NYCHA um, buildings anywhere in, in the country. So this is not unusual. So it has a NYCHA reputation looms large, but we're, ooh, but we're not NYCHA. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization and we were founded in 1982. So this year marks our 40th anniversary. And we just emphasize uh, providing financial resources um, mainly in the area of home ownership and also housing preservation. Um, our board is actually run by people like yourself, you know, residents in the community, um, people have business in the community. And we actually got started by a special program in 1982 called Bank on Brooklyn. And Bank on Brooklyn was actually a response to redlining, which was occurring to mainly African-Americans in other communities of color. So you had a lot of homeowners who basically could not get repair loans um, to do repairs. And this was at a time in, the, you know, we talk about the late seventies going to the early eighties when um, there was a lot of disinvestment. And so to prevent the communities from falling into blight, um, they actually form a organization um, is actually was called NHS of East Flatbush at that time. And we actually acted, acted as a lender. So we actually petitioned like um, the city um, and other private lenders. And actually, we actually made loans and also grants to homeowners so that can actually um, repair and upkeep their property. So that's how we got started in the organization. And actually, since then, we actually added on other services um, in furtherance of our mission. OK, so we have two offices. The main office is at 2806 Church Avenue. Uh, but we also have a Canarsie office, which is at 9701 Avenue L. Um, as you know, community board um, uh, 17 and also 14, actually, you know, we're actually, um, we're actually probably about three blocks away from um, 14 with the board of Bedford Avenue. But those two community boards are actually, um, we get the most referrals from it. And secondly would be community board 18, which is actually Canarsie. And then thirdly would be followed by community board five, which is East New York. And then fourth would be 
uh, nine, and then after that would be six, six uh, community board 16, as far as referrals, then we, we, do, we do get, okay? So what is our service area and in um, the scope of which? So it's pretty, it's pretty large, right? So even though um, our original Jeez. name was- um, So when you're going- Neighborhood Housing Services of, of East Flatbush, um, our service area is actually much broader than that. Um, it always has been. And 2017, we actually changed the name to actually um, um, to come to terms with that. So our service area includes East Flatbush, Canarsie, of course, Midwood, East New York, Crown Heights, Coney Island, Kensington, Brownsville, Flatlands, Flatbush, uh, Sheepshead Bay, Marine Park, um, just to name a few. And there's a couple other uh, areas um, we also serve as well. Okay, now regarding some of our programs and services. So as I said before, we actually started off with a home repair, which my colleague um, is about to get into. We'll get into when he, when he comes on. But first thing, we provide tenant counseling, right? And actually that's been very robust given the need um, in the community. So tenant counseling, what does that entail uh, essentially? Um, oftentimes, um, well, most, well, 60% of New Yorkers are, are tenants, right? So many individuals come to us because they may have questions about their lease, all right? Um, a lot of people don't have leases. You have many individuals who probably live in uh, private houses, two, three family houses, they may not have a lease, or they may live in a building and may not have a lease. So they may have questions about what some of their rights are if they have a lease or don't have a lease. You also have many um, uh, buildings in the community which are uh, rent stabilized, okay? Um, and rent stabilized are usually buildings which were between 1947 and 1974, built between that time. So with rent stabilized buildings, um, with those buildings, uh, rent increases are actually controlled by the Rent Guidelines Board, okay? And with that, a lot of times you have many tenants who may live in a rent stabilized building and may not know it. And oftentimes they may be paying more rent than it really should be paying. All right. Neighborhood Housing Services, we are also a housing ambassador with HPD, the Housing uh, and Preservation Department. So we actually also assist people with, with the um, website Housing Connect, which is the lottery uh, website um, for apartments and also. Uh, Home ownership opportunities as well. Um, little quads is kept. You know they also list uh, condos and also um, one to two family homes um, on there as well. So we assist people with that because, you know, um, as you all know, uh, um, working in in the community, you have a lot a lot of individuals who may not have um, Wi-Fi. They may not be compu uh, computer savvy, or they just might not have a keen idea on how the whole process works as far as that. So we get that. In addition to just people who are looking for housing, which is actually, you know, New York City is actually in a crisis right now. So that is something which is actually beyond our resources. However, you know, we try to do as best as we can and, and, and try to address it, you know, the best way we, we know how, even though the problem may be enormous. So oftentimes we do have relationships with real estate agents. They do come to us. Um, knowing that you know we do get requests on um, people particularly people who have vouchers who are often discriminated against um who come you know who come to us um looking for apartments and you know they they do share listings with us and we try to um you know place as best as possible um we can definitely meet the need because the need is is enormous but we try to do the best that we can with that all right so that's as far as tenant services um or tenant counseling also which is also part and parcel with tenant counseling is renters insurance education. Um, our mission is actually to provide uh, financial uh, um, stability, whether you're a tenant or homeowner. And we don't sell insurance, but we do encourage many tenants to, to get insurance, okay? And um, we actually go over, we actually have workshops on a monthly basis where we actually discuss the policy um, what, what, what are different types of coverage when it comes to rent, uh, renters insurance? Um, premiums, how premiums are calculated, um, different coverages. We, you know, we talk about like loss of use, liability, so so forth and so forth. Um, that's a big thing. Um, there was, you know, in the past couple of years, there was some uh, major fires 
um, in the area, uh, which individual actually lost use of their property. And many of them either had to rely on friends and relatives, if not um, the Red Cross, you know, for shelter or, or going to shelter temporarily. So with renter's insurance, you know, we do urge people to consider that who are, who are um, tenants. Um, so in the event that you have to vacate your property, whether it's a fire, gas issue or whatever, um, you know, you can actually have the insurance um, actually pay for either your hotel or motel stay. So those are some things we, you know, we do cover. Uh, home by education. Now, home by education is actually one of our premier programs that we probably get the most requests for. Okay. Now, neighborhood housing services, we are HUD approved, the housing and urban development. What does that mean? Um, some of our staff, um, currently approximately four of our staff members are HUD approved uh, counselors, meaning that, you know, they have to take certifications and have to show um, um, that they're pretty much versed in various areas of housing, whether it's tenant foreclosure, um, the Fair Housing Act, uh, financial uh, fitness, and a couple of other ones, which 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 um, 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 which escapes me right now. Um, so when it comes to home buyer education, um, we kind of educate people on the home buying process. What um, are they financially ready? Um, down payment assistance, because there are down payment assistance available, which they may not be eligible for. There's one popular down payment assistance called a Home First, which probably has the most um, um, as far as amount, up to $100,000 uh, offered by HPD. Um, which we actually um, do educate people on and actually look to see people qualify for it. And if they do qualify for it, we actually help them meet the guidelines, uh, other guidelines, and also apply for that. But there's also other down payment assistance programs that we do um, inform people during the one-on-one -on -one counseling session at our workshops. Um, Sony Ma, which is the state of New York mortgage assistance program, which is actually like a mortgage it's kind of like New York State's version of FHA. Um, they do have its um, their own down payment assistance program where a person can get like fifteen thousand um, dollars, and also various lenders um, also have down payment assistance programs. It nowhere near approaches what Sony Ma and also Home First um, has, but it actually you know every little bit counts you know towards that. So we do inform people about that uh, as well. Most importantly, we. Um, our home by education uh, also incorporates a lot of uh, financial um, fitness. So we actually go into a person's affordability. We actually goes into a person's credit um, just to make sure there's no negative information on their credit, which would prevent them from getting a mortgage. Um, or perhaps they can get a better rate if they actually uh, increase their, their credit score by, by a few more points. Um, we have classes. We are a, a HUD certified class. Um, for a first time home buyer, if a person is, is, um, interested in receiving down payment assistance and also certain type of mortgages, whether it's uh, Sony Ma or other uh, mortgages like, um, FHA and so forth, they do mandate a person have home buyer education. We are certified to give that also certain lotteries, um, also mandate individuals get home buyer education as well. So we do provide that now landlord training. Um, with landlord training, that's also part and parcel of, of home buyer education. Um, and that's basically for small landlords, let's say two to four units. Um, we actually go into um, some of the, um, the details as far as maintaining your property, um, screening tenants, um, being aware of being knowledgeable of the Fair Housing Act, which is, which is um, surprising how many landlords may not even be uh, aware of that. Um, as far as, you know, if they were to put their home for sale, um, what some things they, they can and cannot say. Like you cannot say in an advertisement or sign that, you know, you're not going to rent to um, um, families with children, all these different things that, you know, we do talk about. Um, landlord training, we also talk about insurance. And also, what are some of your responsibilities in terms of maintaining your property, you know, uh, as a landlord? Um, like things like garbage pickup. If you have... Um, tenants, you know, is basically your responsibility as far as, uh, um, you know, putting the garbage on a curb and doing it properly. All these little things that, you know, that um, 
which is kind of like if you've been doing it for a lot of years, it becomes second nature, but you know, what you want to hammer home to people. It's very, it's very important that anyone who takes a landlord training, whether they're a first time home buyer or the existing landlord, they realize um, being a landlord is, 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 is um, basically you're running a business and um, you have to be prepared. You know, if you're going to be a landlord, there's a possibility that you might have to take a tenant to court for an eviction. You know, that's, that's just the um, cost of doing business. So, you know, we, you know, we try to hammer these things home, you know, to people. So they know what they're getting themselves into and they're properly prepared. And, and it's also a certification course as well. Some other things that, you know, that we do um, in neighborhood housing services. So what we found out that um, um, once you become a, a homeowner, you know, things doesn't just stop. The learning does not just stop for you, okay? So like with the home buyer uh, um, webinars that we give on a monthly basis, we also have webinars geared for um, homeowners covering a myriad amount of topics, whether it's property taxes, um, whether it's insurance, uh, whether it's maintenance, um, we're basically going into the winter season, probably you know, next week, next week officially. So we discuss some seasonal repairs that um, the homeowner should think of, uh, energy efficiency, fire safety. Um, it runs the gamut. Repair grants and loans, um, I'll, I'll allow my, my colleague to, to cover that. Um, mortgage counseling, um, foreclosure is actually a big issue um in new york and actually there's been an uptick due to uh, since covid since many homeowners actually themselves were either impacted directly by covid whether they they themselves were still whether their you know their job was either uh downsized or they were let go or let's say they had tenants who were not paying during that that time period um so we actually um free of charge you know if the individual is behind in their mortgage we try to, you know, ground them first because, you know, it's very stressful and 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 um, it could be um, very anxious for that person. You also, when a person is in foreclosure, you also have a lot of people actually approaching them, you know, e either to sell the house or people, you know, coming with their rescue plans, which are actually, you know, dubious, you know. Um, our organization, we are uh, listed with the attorney general is uh, under HOP, which is the homeowner, homeowner um, um, uh, assistance programs, homeowner uh, preservation program, HOP, okay, and which is a listing of uh, counseling organizations like NHS, in addition to some legal organizations that assist people who are falling behind in them. Okay, I mentioned landlord training, and um, I'll have my colleague. Um, Mr. Todd, we talk about property management um, when he gets on. But as far as as far as is as, as some of our outcomes um, for 2020, and this is just 2020 alone, um, requests, we, we actually received like 9,636 requests. And by request, these run the gamut. So this is any individuals who are either contacting our office for a service, whether they call or email. Um, or let's say that can be, let's say they just need help um, getting a contractor's listing. Let's say they're looking for a home repair grant. Let's say they're looking to purchase a home. Let's say they're looking on um, the find an apartment. Um, all of that encompasses a request for service. All right. So we got like 9,636. All right. Now for home, home ownership preservation, which is basically that goes into foreclosure, um, home repair, um, and so forth, strictly mostly um, uh, 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 focusing on homeowners, we have about 4,217 requests, okay? Now, regarding home ownership, now these are people who actually closed, right? We actually saw them from point A to point B, all right? We actually closed on 12 mortgages um, during, the t uh, during the period of 2022. Now we actually had more people interested in home ownership, but these actually people who actually identified, we identified as actually closing. Cause oftentimes um, some individuals may either take longer to close or, you know, they may get frustrated and, and just um, probably find some other means of uh, closing and they may not contact us. But as far as those who's actually stuck it out with us, we have about 12 people actually 
closed on, on mortgages with us. Now, as far as foreclosure modifications, um, for this year, we had about 161. All right. Now, home repair services, we had about 13 um, affordable uh, loans and grants. All right. Totaling 260,000. All right. And that includes two grants in which my colleague will, will talk more about. That's AHC and also another one called Home Fix that we had for the year. All right, now as far as tenant support services, we had about 250 persons who, who assisted, whether it was in terms of Housing Connect, in terms of finding an apartment, in terms of getting them some legal assistance with an eviction and so forth. Now, resi resiliency services is pretty much encompasses because um, we also provide a homeowner, uh, homeowners insurance counseling, right? Um, every month we provide a workshop on homeowners insurance where we actually, similar to the renters insurance workshop, where we discuss um, basically uh, how premiums are calculated, different types of coverage, um, things you, uh, you should look for. We, we discuss, are you paying too much insurance? Um, the importance of flood insurance and so forth. So that's basically resilience. In addition to, we also have um, also disaster preparedness workshops as well. So we had about what 384 residents actually attended. Either they either came to a, a workshop affiliated with resiliency or actually had counseling. And for property management, we're currently, um, this is as of September, managing 30, 33 units. Okay. So all right, so um, our website is, is nhsbrooklyn.org. And I just want to know, Byron, if you unmute yourself, uh, are you here yet? I don't see him, Tyrone. If you want to maybe um, take, if there's any questions if the co-chairs want to entertain sure. questions at this point sure. so at this then, point um, anybody have any questions on, on anything that i just mentioned um more than welcome to actually uh answer them go right ahead yeah if anyone has a question if you could just raise your hand i'll uh i'll call you in order call that, you in uh, order that uh that anyone has has a question has a question i just wanted to say i'm here now <laughs> and hello I'm sorry hello. for being a welcome. little late welcome. and uh, i'm happy to man the uh questions <laughs> that are here okay, i'm not seeing any questions just yet um i i just had a question about um just sort of generally sure. i know you've talked a little bit about how um how folks come to you, you know, and, and uh, by referrals or by requests. Is there a difference between the referrals and requests? Do you have do you work with uh, partners who who also bring in folks who uh, who are you able to help as well? Sure, absolutely, um, absolutely. Now, as far as um, requests, on um, being digital age, we we get like um, some of the most biggest uh, requests we, we we do get is from like Google searches. All right, like Google searches, that's probably number one um, as far as how people find us. Okay. But our other requests actually come from, we also get like a lot of requests from elected officials. All right. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Very, a lot of requests from elected officials and also other non for profits. There's actually a platform called Unite Us, um, which is actually a non for profit platform um, in which, you know, um, lists like uh, um, what happens is it's actually started um, with. Um, um healthcare organizations who who individuals needed like health insurance and they probably came in for other health issues and they also had um other issues probably housing and uh, and, and snap benefits so what they did was they actually um connected with a, a, um a, a, um a software organization so they created um unite us um so it's like a referral systems you know where you know you, you know um individuals who have any, you know, needs, you know, they can actually refer um, individuals to Unite Us. So we also get it from them and also other, other not-for-profits as well, um, in addition to 311, um, 311 and, and so forth. So, yeah, so that's some of the ways that, you know, we, you know, in addition to word of mouth is also big as well for past that's clients. Right. Great. 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 
All right, so I, I think we do have a question. Have a question. Um, um, the participants. So we, uh, Dwayne Joseph, uh, please, uh, please uh, proceed with your question. Proceed with your question. Thanks, Greg. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Tyrone. Good evening, Tyrone. Just for clarification, for purposes, clarification um, purposes, um, you mentioned that uh, it does help does people with vouchers, vouchers um, because you receive um, a list from, the, from whatever agency. You don't actually have a question. I think we have an echo. Uh, have we have an um, echo. Have an echo. Um, Talisha, actually. Oh, okay. I, I think it might have been. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Please, uh, Dwayne, perhaps you want to start uh, from the beginning just so we can all uh, make sure we've heard your question. Thank sure. You. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Okay. Um, so, Tyrone, you, you actually mentioned that you guys have a list uh, of apartments you get from an agency of some sort um, for people who um, are receiving some sort of housing voucher. Um, but I just wanted clarification on whether or not you guys actually offer apartments. You don't, correct? I think Tyrone, you're muted. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, um, yes, like we're not a, a a housing developer, at least not yet. So we are basically uh, um, um, an intermediary between, let's say, real estate agents or, or let's say, property owners for, for the time being. But we don't, we we don't, we we don't build housing, um, you know, to to offer yet. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that you know we worked together in the past, and that's always a question that came up in the past with yeah. folks that I referred over to you guys. Uh, so I want to make sure I was on the record. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, no, no. We don't build. We we don't deal with properties. You, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I liked that yet though. That's a, not, now. There's a little intrigue. <laughs> no, not yet. I, I have to throw that in there because, um, <laughs> you know, um, especially the way the way the world is now, um, and you know, um, and we do have some vision. Um, and when my colleague hops on, we do have like the property management program, which was like the brainchild of my director in terms of um, helping like small property owners manage property. So, so it, it is something we are looking at as far as um, and, and definitely in the future, um, because there is a definitely a definitely a need, but currently not yet. I don't see any other questions at the moment, so we can either handle it uh, one of two ways. Um, um, we can wait for Mr. Todman uh, for another moment here, but we, we may may be better to move on to the next agenda item at yeah. the moment, and then we'll uh, we'll keep you in reserve, Mr. McDonald, if, uh, sure. if we can go back to you uh, perhaps later in the pro in the program. Sure. All right. Okay, great. Right here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I guess then we could turn to agenda item number two. And uh, Talisha, did you want to uh, jump in here? Do you want to do you want to do you want to handle uh, agenda item number two? Item number two. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. <laughs> so next up we have uh, um, Lucy Block, who will be speaking with us about uh, the overview of the displacement alert portal DAP. Um, and I think I saw Lucy here. Lucy is here. Yep. Hi. <laughs> okay. So you can go ahead and take it away. Okay. Sounds good. Um, hi, everybody. I uh, oh, I think there might be an okay. Echo, I think, is gone. Um, I am not super used to WebEx. Uh, I've never presented on it before, but it looks pretty straightforward. So hopefully. There won't be too much of a problem. Um, it looks like it's a pretty small group in here. Um, it works well for me if you put questions in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on it. But also if any of the folks from the community board want to keep an eye on the chat and like you can you can speak as I go and then if it's just kind of too long to get into, we can hold it till the end. Um, and I'm likely not going to be able to answer like specific questions about individual buildings or anything like that. Um, I figured I would just orient you all to the tool um, and give you some ideas for how it could be useful. 
<clears throat> um, and then it was Melissa who invited me. So I just want to check and see if Melissa or anyone else has anything you want to say about like uh, what you would like to learn. And then I can try to focus on that a little bit um, or you don't need to say anything and I can just get into it. Um, I, I would just invite you to share. I think we're inviting you to share as much as you would like about this tool and these tools that ANHD, and if you wanted to share a bit about ANHD as well, and just introduce your organization, I think would be fantastic. Sure. Um, happy to do that. Uh, so just before I get into DAP, um, ANHD is the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. So we're a 50 year old umbrella organization. NHS is actually one of our members. Um, and uh, we, uh, our, our members are a lot of community development corporations, uh, nonprofit developers of affordable housing, and other community based organizations that work in housing justice, uh, economic justice, uh, and in New York City neighborhoods. If I didn't mention, we have about 80 members across the city. Um, so I dropped our link in the chat, so you're welcome to check us out if you're not familiar already, and, uh, and you can sign up for our email list. We do a lot of different things, so I'm just going to be talking about one of those. Um, so I'm the Senior Research and Data Associate, and I have managed the Displacement Alert Project for the last five plus years. Um, and I'm going to share my screen so that I can talk to you about that portal. Oh, of course. Okay, it says I need to open my system preferences, so this might take me a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, I need to quit and reopen WebEx, so I will be right back. Hopefully, it will only take a moment. Sorry, Lucy. Yeah, that, that does happen, but you should be good when you're back on. Okay. So while Lucy's signing back in, um, I'll just mention um, that ANHD actually was a participant in our Lunch and Learn series. Um, and so if you want to learn more about the organization, you can go uh, onto our YouTube channel because that's recorded there. Um, and she's back. <laughs> um, okay, let me try again to share my screen. Let me make sure. Just made you the presenter. Yes, I'm just trying to. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think. Do you all see uh, a slideshow? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, do you see my whole screen or just uh, just the slides? Whole screen. Got it. Clearly, I don't know how to use WebEx. Better. Okay, I think I'm good to go. Um, yep. Thanks again for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to be doing basically a short version of the of the the training that I give off and on dot portal. So it's really meant to be like a quick introduction to the different features. It's a website that has a lot to it. Um, so I definitely encourage you to play around with it. Um, and I'll give you some ideas for what you can explore and then you're welcome to email me afterwards if you have any questions. Um, these slides are also available to you if you go to this link, which I'm putting in the chat as well. So you should be able to click on that if you wanna follow along and then you'll have them after. So uh, DAP portal um, is, the, is the displacement alert project portal. Uh, DAP portal is part of a series of tools that we developed over time and all of them with the intention of gathering together all of the vast amounts of open data that the city makes available, which is really useful, but also uh, there's tons of it. If you go to uh, HPD code violations data, there are millions and millions of rows. Um, so it's out there, but it can be quite difficult to, to make sense of. Um, and so we've developed uh, a few tools over the years. Our most recent tool is that portal. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you what that is and what you can do with it. Um, that portal is uh, specifically geared towards uh, 
a few different audiences. So I developed it uh, in many cases with our, our member organizations and tenant organizers specifically in mind, but it's really grown throughout the years. Um, we had elected officials and their staff, their constituent services staff who were really interested in using it, community boards who were interested in using it, uh, legal services providers. And so we've also adapted it over time to be more flexible um, so that it can serve uses by a variety of audiences. And the focus is really to understand what's happening in New York City's buildings and where New Yorkers might be at uh, highest risk of displacement. And that could be uh, as tenants or small homeowners. Uh, again, the tool was developed originally uh, with multifamily tenants in mind, but again, we've added data that we can in order to, um, to make it useful and helpful in, uh, you know, neighborhoods in the farther outer boroughs. I live in Elmhurst, small homes, et cetera. Um, there are three main features in DAP portal. So the first one is called property lookup, and this is where you can enter an address for any building in New York City, and you'll get basically a profile um, with a lot of, kind of more static information about the property, like when it was built and the total number of units, what districts it falls in, and then you have this much more frequently updating data um, of all different kinds of data sets from city sources. So on the left-hand side, which you might have seen over here, this is what it looks like collapsed, and you've got those uh, more kind of overarching general data points, which can help you answer questions such as, how old is the building? So you might, might be able to see, like, is it a pre-1974 building? So it's likely rent stabilized. How many units does it have? We have data on the number of stabilized units over time which uh, is tricky to get, and it's actually scraped uh, from, uh, from tax bills by open data advocates so that we can get a sense of stabilization numbers over time. That dynamic has changed a lot in the last few years, but that data is in there between 2007 and 2020. Uh, we have all recorded information about who owns the building, any subsidies or particular programs, um, zoning information, and a little map of where it is. And then, as I mentioned, these are the more uh, specific data sets that come from HPD, Department of Finance, Department of Buildings, um, and it has all kinds of data that updates automatically as soon as it's available. So if the data set is updated on the open data portal daily, then it's updated here daily with maybe a one day lag. Um, and you know, if it's updated monthly, then it's updated monthly here. So this can help you answer lots of additional questions like when is the last time the building was sold and for what amount, who financed it, are there recent evictions or eviction filings, what are tenants filing complaints about, uh, what's going on with construction, you know, are there broken elevators, is the landlord renovating, all of these things that there are records for, we collect those records and put them here. Um, here's an example of one of the data tables for sales information. So we uh, basically filtered what's in ACRIS for sales uh, or, or deeds and mortgage related documents. And ACRIS is very complicated. With all of this, we've attempted to simplify it while still providing lots of information. Um, so we try to hit that balance. Um, the second main feature is called district dashboard. And this is what offers kind of just a uh, profile of any geography that you're interested in in New York City. So here you see a screenshot of Queens Community District 4 because that's where I live. Um, but I will, I'm happy to show you all what it looks like for Brooklyn 14 a little in a, in a few moments. Um, you can get, let's see if it's on the next slide. Uh, you basically can select from um, some default filters and you can look at basically the housing type um, some different filters for what we call risk factors. So these are um, data sets that you can use to look for high displacement risk in a building, but it is not the only way to look for displacement risk in a building. Um, and you can toggle these on and off. You can look at uh, different data periods. So if you want to, you know, say, show me all of the buildings that have had at least 100 HPD violations in the last year, you can switch that on, you can adjust the number and change the time period. So you've got some kind of like point and click options here on the district dashboard, and it will produce a, uh, a map that looks like this that you can hover over, click on these and go to the property, or, um, or it'll click show you a list of the buildings. So this is what those, uh, that result, those results would look like, sorry. 
Um, here's what it would look like when you're looking at the map, and then you can turn on the table and you'll get a table with um, some of those high level statistics about the buildings, like the number of units, the year it was built. Uh, you can export any table in here as a CSV if you want to create a list of buildings and then download it and put it into your own um, spreadsheet system that you use for tracking anything involving buildings. Um, and then the third main feature is the, uh, the custom search. The custom search is kind of like the district dashboard, except that you get to choose everything about what you're searching for. So you get to um, add on all kinds of specifics about the different data sets that you want to filter for and anything that's in there, you can combine it with anything else, however you'd like. So there are lots of options. It's a little more like uh, pick your own adventure. Um, so if you really know what you're looking for or um, you get comfortable with the tool and want to dive in really deep, or if you just have, you know, a particular um, search that you're trying to do, I'll show you what data sets are in here that are an in district dashboard, but it's very flexible and can help with a lot of different kinds of research questions. And then when you um, when you do a custom search, you'll get results that look very similar to if you use the district dashboard. Um, you can also save custom searches once you create an account on that portal. And so on the next slide, you see what it looks like to sign up for an account. When you're on the website, there's a little login slash sign up button, and then you can register for an account, which is very straightforward. It's a standard sign up process. You'll get an email to verify. Um, once you have an account, you will have a another tab pop up uh, once you're logged in and it says my dashboard. And my dashboard is where you can see any properties that you have bookmarked or custom searches that you've saved. So if you saw a couple of slides back, there's a little star on the upper right hand side. That's where you would save the search. Um, and then you can you will see it in your dashboard and you can also at the same time subscribe to notifications. So what that does is if there are new results to the search, you'll get an email. Um, if any of you have used Street Easy to look for an apartment to rent or to buy, uh, you can save your search and get emails when there are new results to the search. So it functions similarly to that. And the bookmark properties is just if you're on a property that you're interested in keeping an eye on, you can just click a little bookmark icon when you're on it and it will also show up here. So um, you can also see on this screen, uh, once you sign up for an account and you go to my dashboard, there is a gray button on the upper right hand side that says request access to housing court and foreclosures data. And that's because housing court data from the state office of court administration and foreclosures data are not open data. You can't just go to somewhere like the New York City open data portal and get them. There's um, certain protections around them. In some cases, like with foreclosures data, it's collected often by private companies. And we just don't want to uh, make it easier for bad actors to use this data quickly. And so, in order to provide a level of protection, we uh, we have users fill out a short form and we have some uh, groups of users that we approve by default and some others that we give a quick review and I'll show you what those include. Um, so by default, any staff of ANHD member organizations will get approved, as will New York City and state elected officials and their staff, members of government agent or staff of government agencies and members of community boards. So the easiest way for us to check that is if you use a government email address, but I realize that members of community boards uh, often don't have a .gov email address, and that's fine. We just ask that you identify yourself as a community board member uh, if and when you sign up. And then there's a third category of others who are using this data to stop speculation and displacement and or further tenant rights and who are not profiting from its use. The not profiting from its use part is really the most important one. Uh, we don't want this data being used for people to find properties that they want to buy up um, as speculative investments uh, and then potentially displace the people living in those buildings. So some examples of who that might be and who we've approved in the past in this category would be tenants who are part of tenant associations, tenant organizers who are not part of ANHG member organizations, legal services providers, um, or uh, academic or not-for-profit policy researchers. 
anyone who requests access to the protected data needs to confirm that they won't use the data for profit or commercial or personal gain. They won't use it to discriminate and they won't use the data to directly or indirectly displace any person. Again, those are just our safeguards against the data being used for predatory or um, or speculative practices. Um, there's a link here in the slides to the full data access policy, which is also on our website. And then uh, because we have housing court data and it's pretty new, um, I just have a glossary in here of some of the terms because it take, the legal terms are can be very confusing um, and I'm not going to go through them, but if you'll have these in the slides, if those are helpful, those are some of the terms that you might see in the data on our website. This is what it looks like when you request uh, data access to the protected data. You click that gray button in my dashboard. Once you're logged in, you select which statement applies to you, and then you fill out the short form. We review it and we get back to you as soon as we can. If you do it this evening, I might be able to approve it this evening um, or at the latest tomorrow morning. And then this is what it looks like once you have your account and you start saving some properties, saving some custom searches. Um, it's a pretty kind of default user dashboard, uh, should look similar to other websites. Um, so that is my, my quick intro without actually showing you the website. I didn't wanna take up too much time and I think, I just wanna do a time check. I'm happy to do a little bit of a demo actually going through the website myself, but maybe I can pause for questions and, and check in about how much time is left. Um, um, maybe we pause for questions for a moment, uh, Felicia. I'm sorry, I jumped in there. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to suggest the same that uh, we just pause for any questions. Um, I don't. I see that Dwayne has his hand up. I don't know if that was from before or if that's new. That's new, but Sean had her hand up first. Had her first so. Okay. So Sean Campbell. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Lucy, I just want to know if there's a, a way to get the data comparatively, like if you can click on two community districts and, and maybe compare HPD violations um, district to district or, or like how many have more than 50 in each district or something like that. Yes, that's a good question. And I would say that this tool is not the best to use for that kind of aggregate comparison of the entire district to another entire district because this is um, built to filter for specific buildings. So what okay. you could do, you, you could take an aggregate. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if you could oh. find how many total, like it's possible you could find how many total violations are pretty much in a district, but it's just not the easiest tool to use to get that's that fine yeah it's it's okay this has been a great preview of a rabbit hole i'm sure i'll spend a lot of time in starting tomorrow yeah and there there might be other good places to look for that um and one i'll try to drop the link in here is um is nhu's risk chart which we put out annually um so i'll make sure to drop that in the chat i appreciate that thank you and thanks for letting me thanks go for letting me go <laughs> okay uh Duane, you're up uh, just a quick second back because I think I missed it uh, about the rent stabilization um, section on the dashboard once you open up a, a property. Um, mm -hmm. How is that information um, collated? Yeah, well, why don't I show you? And then I can also get to the question that came up in the chat. So I found um, just an example building earlier. This is like the case study I put out there, which is let's say hypothetically a tenant who lives at 120 East 19th Street joins one of your meetings and says that they're having issue with they need repairs in their apartment. Um, and you've maybe like heard about this building, you wanna find out more information. So uh, I have a link up here, but I'll show you how you would look for it. You, would, oh, it's already there. Okay, so I would just type in 120 East 19th Street And so over here, there's this tab for rent stabilization. Um, we have the count over time year by year. And so Dwayne, your question was where this data comes from or just you wanted to look at it? Just where the data comes from. Yeah, so it comes from New York City property tax bills. Um, it is not easy to get a hold of. Um, you all might know that. <laughs> 
Um, HCR does not just publish these numbers annually, um, but they do uh, send the numbers to the Department of Finance and the Department of Finance uh, notes it on tax bills because landlords are required to pay a $20 fee per unit, per registered stabilized unit. And those PDFs are public and from those PDFs, people who are good at coding can scrape them all together and put it into a data set. So it is, these are, numbers are to be taken with a grain of salt because they, um, you know, among being kind of taken from one source via another source, they're completely subject to landlords registering their stabilized units. Um, and there are, I think, well, there's plenty of instances of landlords not registering their units um, and also just inaccuracies either in the landlord reporting or, you know, somewhere along the way, the numbers, sometimes you'll see numbers of stabilized units that are much higher than the total number of units, which does not make sense. And I don't know exactly why that happens sometimes. No, thank you for that. I did, yeah, Cause I've been through the experience where looking for registered units and like for years and years, it doesn't pop up anywhere. So I was just curious as to how you were collecting the data. Good, yeah. Well, I'm glad to be able to point you to something. I can also show you, why don't I, since there was also a question about your district, which I assumed you all would want to take a look at, um, I'm going to pull it up and then you can see a little bit uh, more on rent stabilization and I'll also show you what you could potentially do with a, a custom search. So this is what the community district dashboard looks like. And by default, it's going to pull all residential housing in the neighborhood as opposed to breaking it down by housing type. You'll also see these little question marks around everywhere, and that's to give you a bit more of an explanation of whatever it is showing. Um, so we kind of created our own uh, housing type definitions. Um, and so they are, you know, if you all are familiar with the landscape of housing in New York City, you know that it's messy and confusing and complicated. So again, these categories are nothing official. They're just our best attempt to categorize housing for the purpose of being able to, to explore what's going on. Um, so uh, what I remember from mapping some of this data is that your district has a, a really large concentration of stabilized units. I remember looking at maps of stabilized units and seeing just Ocean Parkway like really bright kind of light up. Um, and so I'm going to click here. You'll see that there are 10,881 residential properties in the district and about 65,000 units. And when I click rent stabilized, you'll see that 66.7% of all the units are in, and this is where it gets a little confusing. They're in buildings that have been rent stabilized. This gets very confusing in districts where there's been a lot of deregulation of stabilized units, but um, this me this is any building that has been stabilized. So two thirds of your district, two thirds of the units in your district are in buildings that have been stabilized. I know that's a little confusing, um, but there are uh, yeah, unfortunately, complexities to how we um, are able to to show it quickly. Um, in any case, if I hit display anyway, you're going to get uh, all display because uh, just if there are more than a thousand results, it makes sure you want to display it because it could slow down your browser. But if I zoom in, you'll see the, the large concentrations of stabilized buildings. And I imagine that you'll recognize these as some of the, the blocks with large older buildings in the district. Um, and then in terms of figuring out what is at risk, how many units are at risk? Uh, it's an interesting question because the the whole reason that this tool is complex and takes, you know, you can do so many things with it, it takes a while to to figure out everything that you can do with it is because there is no single way to determine how many units are at risk. And there are so many different kinds of risk criteria that you could use. So in some districts, like, let's say before 2019, if you looked at Greenpoint Williamsburg, Almost any building that was stabilized before uh, 1974 was going to be almost completely deregulated or or somewhere like long along the process of deregulation and the rents were so high that that was one of the most common forms of displacement. Whereas if you look at the South Bronx, uh, units may still be regulated and stabilized, but there may be uh, problems with housing conditions, lack of heat and hot water evictions and so the um the 
the trends of displacement that happen in different neighborhoods really varies based on lots of different factors, including the type of housing stock, the history of the neighborhood, lots of different things. And so that's kind of the idea behind being able to pick some of these different criteria um, and see what's going on. So for example, 84 buildings with at least five HPD complaints in the last 30 days, I could click on one of these, pick one, and then go here and take a look at what all of the different complaints are. And so I can take a look at what's going on in this building. So there's heat and hot water. Um, and then once I'm logged in, then I can start looking at things like the housing court cases and any data on foreclosures. So um, here you can see the history of non-payment and holdover cases and some of the outcomes. So lately I've been really, you know, look, paying attention to what's happening in terms of eviction filings over the course of the pandemic and since the moratorium expired in January. Um, and doing some some other data analysis with it, but you can see a lot of what's happening at an individual building level in here. And then you could do something like use the custom search. I know I'm kind of like hopping around quick. Just want to make sure I have a chance to show you. You could um, filter here, and you can see that in the custom search, you can use any of those filters that show up on property lookup, plus a couple kind of yes no, like was it on the last tax lien sale. Um, and I can choose housing court cases. I can pick a case type of non-payment cases and I can, this would give me how many in the last year. I could say how many have there been since the beginning, of, let's say just one month ago, 2022, non-payment or, and you can combine different criteria with and or, um, at least one housing court case, that's a non-payment or at least one housing court case that's a holdover as the two types of eviction cases. I can submit that. Might take a minute to run because it's looking at a lot of buildings and a lot of data. <clears throat> and what I got here is the 78 properties. Um, and there have been 116 eviction cases filed in those properties in the last 30 days. And so this is the way that you could ask a question like how many eviction cases have been filed in our district in the last month. And you can you can sort here, you can look at how which ones have had the most. So this one had eight cases filed, um, 36, 37 unit building, uh, built in 2016, a newer building. That's kind of surprising to me. So you can dig into it and see what's happening. They filed eight different cases all in one day. Uh, 421A building, you can take a look at the owners. Uh, if you're familiar with the tool, who owns what, there's a link here, which is going to show you what other properties are uh, potentially owned by the same landlord by linking some of the registration data. So you can get a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff. So I apologize for going quickly through it, but I'm going to, I'm going to pause again for questions. Thank you for all that, uh, Lucy, and on behalf of Barden in the comments as well, who said that he has an irritating cough <laughs> or else he would unmute. Um, yeah, this is a lot of good information. Um, uh, but Greg, I think that you have a question. Oh, yeah, I did have my hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, I think you answered the first, first part of my question of, you know, sort of what are the you know, the, 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 the hot button, you know, triggers here in, in terms of what to be most concerned about. But it sounds like it's, it's pretty complex to figure that out. Um, but I guess the second part of my question <laughs> is what, um, what, if you do find yourself, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a building at risk or, or trouble building of, of this sort, is there anything that you can do sort of preemptively or, 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 or you know, just, just things to think about if, uh, you know, if you, you do find yourself in that situation. Yeah. Um, do you mean as an individual tenant from that perspective or what kind of scenario are you thinking about? Yeah, I, I guess from the tenant perspective, I was thinking mostly. Yeah. Um, sorry, excuse me. So we um, really recommend that someone uh, look out for the any local tenant organizing group, like getting connected to uh, a tenant organization is really, really important to be able to find out if there are similar things happening. Well, also just 
having someone talk to their neighbors and find out whether it's a systematic problem in the building because there are different um, kinds of responses if someone's being targeted as an individual versus um, something happening to many tenants in a building. If there's a building-wide lack of repairs going on, then tenants could um, come together, potentially file an, an HP case for repairs in housing court um, and compel the landlord to do repairs. There's, of course, a ton of different strategies and approaches they can take. They can even just like write a letter altogether. You know, there's a, there's a, a series of things that tenants can do. Um, there's a whole other set of things to do if they're facing eviction. Um, obviously, they want to get uh, connected to an attorney. That's a big problem right now is that there aren't enough right to counsel attorneys available for the pace of eviction cases that are moving through the courts. Some people are facing eviction who are qualified for a free lawyer without having the free lawyer. Um, and so the right to counsel coalition is working on that. It's just it's kind of like across the board, like it's important for them to find out about their rights. They can do that by um, calling the Met Council on housing hotline. Uh, they can call 311. They can call the housing court answers hotline. Uh, finding a local tenant organizing group. Sometimes the uh, sometimes I, I imagine you all have some of that information. Um, this is Flatbush, right? So Flatbush, Flatbush Tenants Coalition uh, operates in your district. I imagine. I don't know if it's if the boundaries are exact. Um, yeah, they're so here. They're they're, they're here. Oh, yeah, they're well, not here, here, but yeah, we do make referrals uh, to them. Yes, so definitely. Sorry, I didn't come to me right away, but Flatbush Tenants Coalition is a great group, and I would absolutely recommend putting folks in contact with them. Um, and most of those tenant organizations work with legal services providers who can um, help out tenants uh, if they're facing individual eviction or want to bring a proactive case against their landlord. Just as as some examples. <laughs> uh, thank you, and I know uh, uh, Sean, you put that in the chat. Uh, I see about uh, the efforts with the HPD man as well. Yep. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I'm wondering if I can uh, ask a, a quick question, or at least what I think is a quick question. Um, maybe I missed it in uh, the clicking that you were doing, Lucy, but is is there a way to see like if the owner of this building has other buildings uh, that are also have, let's say, a high rate of, uh, in this case, eviction filings? Yes. Under yes. like the who owns what or something? So who owns what is built by friends of ours uh, at the organization Just Fix. So they have a tool called Who Owns What that's designed to do exactly what you're talking about. And uh, kind of like rent stabilization data, because building owners can own their buildings through an LLC and they're not required to disclose who is connected to the LLC, um, that can make it really difficult to identify common ownership. Um, or even things like if someone's an individual, but their name is spelled slightly differently and different like to HPD versus to the Department of Finance, um, or just in different HPD registrations, all of that makes it complicated. Uh, just Fix uses uh, the registered building addresses for the LLCs that are that own, or the individuals that are listed with HPD as owners. Um, and they use a combination of linking by address and linking by name. So uh, like lots of other types of data, it's not clean and perfect because uh, they're finding a way to draw connections among data that's not designed to draw those connections. Um, but this is the best way to identify uh, common ownership. So I clicked on this. You'll see it's associated with 221 buildings. One thing to look out for is if any of the individuals have really common names, then that might be a reason that they're being linked to, to other buildings like the stabilization data, take this you know, as a starting point, but you can see the portfolio and you can see some aggregate. There's a uh, summary information where you can see like a map of the entire portfolio, some aggregated statistics for the whole portfolio. Um, and then you can also use the map to see what would be, uh, what else would be in your district, click on it, go to those. Um, and then for other buildings, you can actually also go back to dot portal for any of those. So we try to link them together so that you can go back and forth if need be. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is really extensive. Uh, I, I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the and um, the, and, um <clears throat> I'm happy to take um any more questions, but I'll just say like uh we're always looking for feedback on, you know, especially like if you've dug into the tool a little bit, familiarized yourself and you have questions or there's something in there that would be additionally helpful. We love to hear that so we can try to incorporate it um, as we plan improvements for the future. And just one more question, I guess um, this is only for uh, this is not for any property uh, of any kind. It's only for uh, rent rental properties. So that's so a, that's a really good question. Sorry, I'll wait. Question. Sorry, I'll wait. Oh. Um, thanks. Um, so no, you can search for any property in here. I will search for my office building to show you. Um, <clears throat> there will often be less data because we use a lot of like residential types, residential housing types of data sets. Like there's nothing from HPD for an office building. Um, there's no, well, there could be an evictions data. Um, there could be a commercial eviction. There isn't here, which is a good thing. Um, Department of Buildings data will show up. Litigations against the landlord will most likely not show up because those are, that's maintained by HPD where they're named as a party. Foreclosures could show up, total, total units. Um, just as a, a side note, you know, if you're wondering what other elected officials somewhere overlaps with, like you can use this tool just to find that out. So you could put in a property and then you can see which assembly districts, Senate district, the state Senate districts are based on what's gonna be the case as of January. So don't pay attention for the next two weeks because it might be inaccurate. Um, zip code uh, and then and community districts. So I imagine for you all that, that could be helpful if you're trying to figure out um, who else, you know, which council member to refer somebody to, for example. Um, so there is a lot of data, no HPD registrations found. So some of the data is available for non-residential properties. It is definitely available for um, for homes that are owned, uh, co-ops and condos. The co-op and condo data also gets a little funky, um, but it's there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions from participants? Uh, I don't see any. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Lucy. And I, I, I think that we have your information, um, but if people want to maybe contact you, do you want to just drop uh, maybe some more information if you feel comfortable uh, in the chat? Um, I dropped my email and yeah, um, I appreciate the invite. Thanks for, for having me. And I'm going to also pop in one more resource after I stop sharing my screen of the, the risk chart that um, that there was a question about just for the, the larger aggregated statistics of districts. But um, yeah, thank you for, for having me join you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. I guess I'll uh, <laughs> jump back in here. So we, I see that uh, Mr. Todman from NHS Brooklyn has joined us. Uh, thank you. Um, so to, uh, to to shift back there, if, if we could uh, have a few minutes uh, of your presentation on property management, we would greatly appreciate that, that before we move on to our final agenda items. So uh, Mr. Todman, uh, welcome and uh, please proceed uh, when you're ready. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. I, my apologies. I got uh, pulled into another webinar uh, due to a cancellation of one of my colleagues. Um, very excited. Uh, I know my colleague Tyrone has summarized NHS Brooklyn for you guys. As part of our business, NHS Brooklyn has started a property management business targeting owners of one to four family properties. We, uh, we have a very small department as we are just getting started. 
is just myself, Isana Saxon, and a consultant by the name of Taiwan Anthony. Um, we've been in business for about a year now, we have uh, 33 units under management, and we are working diligently to get the word out and continue to build out the business. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, it's a new program. We are also um, work, willing to work with small mixed use buildings. That's a ground floor commercial space with one to four residential units above. Um, the owners do not have to live on the property. The goal of this program is to bring uh, affordable, high quality property management to small property owners. Everybody's familiar with that most uh, six units, buildings and up have property managers. We're looking to do that for small out property owners with the usual NHS twist. Um, people who join the program uh, can opt to be educated in property management. Um, if you if you are not confident in your skills, we are basically we will work with you um, for a year to help you build your skills in property management, help you to understand some of the tools that we use so you can separate from us after a year and take over the management of your property. We'd love to have you if you wanna stay, but uh, as NHS uh, business practice is really about education in the community, preserving and building wealth and wealth generation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we, we offer the st standard menu of services that large property owners offer. Rent collection, repairs and maintenance, equipment supplies, receipt of legal notices, coordinating and assigning personnel, leasing space, uh, residential and commercial, uh, tenant selection and identification. Basically, we, we adjust our agreement to fit the needs of our clients. So um, we're, we're able to do some individual negotiations from client to client instead of having a boilerplate contract. For example, um, we, we adjust the amount of repairs the amount of dollar repair that we're able to execute on our own based on our client comfort. Some clients are comfortable with us executing repairs for $1,000 on our own. Some clients are comfortable with $300. It's basically to um, work with our clients in you know, whatever best fits their needs. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry if I'm speaking kind of fast, I know it's been a long day for you guys, it's me as well, it's a couple of presentations. So one of the things we did uh, before we rolled out our business was, you know, come up with a list of contractors, realtors, attorneys, insurance companies, home inspectors. Um, so we have a list of professionals to address whatever needs our client has. Um, is what we do in our standard business practice is that anyone referred to you is licensed and insured. Uh, because uh, we encourage people to do that as part of home ownership. So if we're doing your home ownership management, we need to do the same. Uh, next slide. Well, I guess that's the end of my presentation. So um, everybody know our offices. Um, I'll put my email in the in the chat if anybody wants to get in touch with me, along uh, along with our direct email for our property management business. Okay. But you will find. You know, I'd like to throw up uh, briefly since since um um, uh, community board fourteen actually would probably benefit from it is um, State Center Parker's actually scholarship program because um, much of community board 14 actually would, would you know, is in his district. So I'm gonna throw that up there briefly so you could just go over that if you don't mind. No, 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 no. 
Oh yes, As when we when we started talking about the program last year, um, Senator Parker graciously agreed to sponsor uh, seniors in his district, 62 or older, for a um, a one-year scholarship. This would entitle them to free property management service. So um, seniors in the district will be basically you get a year of free service. Everything that I went through during the presentation, uh, they will be eligible. Thank you for this information. I, I, I see that Glenn Wallen has his hand up. Glenn, do you want to ask a question? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, so you say that this management program of yours is um affordable i guess but i would like yes. to know what that means what is your fee schedule and how does it compare uh, to the industry standards thank you our our fee schedule is eight percent on the rents so um let's say if you're in a property you're in a two-family property is only one rental unit um we will still manage the property with you in it but our fee would only be on the rental unit It'd be eight percent on the rental unit, which is uh, ranges um, fees re range from anywhere from twelve to fifteen percent. So we're at four percentage points below the standard fee to start. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for? NHS. Greg, I see you have your hand up. Sure, just one quick question. So um, in terms of uh, the type of units that are targeted, aside from it being one to four units, are, are, they, are you also targeting, um, you know, affordable or rent stabilized or any, any units uh, of, in that respect as part of the program or not, not really? Uh, not really, and we can't do rent stabilized because it's outside of our target. Okay. So five units is the maximum for us. Understood. Um, Six units above falls into um, large multis. Got it. All right. Thank you. So. And I, I guess I'll just jump in um, and, and ask uh, uh, just for a clarification. I saw on one of your slides, you, you say that you have a, a list of um, services that or, or that you provide under the property management. Um, it, does that mean that people can sort of pick and choose what they want no, we, from we, you we, or? We basically, I tell people we offer ownership service. So everything you do as the owner of the property, we would do for you. So um, we'd collect the rents, pay the bills, um, we register the property if the owner is not on the property. So um, we'll arrange, um, it's not for free, but we would schedule a service to do the garbage, um, clean the sidewalk on the garbage collection days, snow, snow removal, uh, the works. And, and can homeowners or property owners can can they choose like between those services? Like, let's say I had a a, a rental property, uh, and you know, like I I wanted to hire NHS to do the property management services, but I only wanted you to you know handle you know cleaning up and uh, on garbage collection days to uh, take out the garbage and clean up the snow. Uh, but I didn't want you to collect rent uh, or have to deal with repairs. Is, is that something that you, that I would be able to tailor or is it just like, you know, you have your package already set and this is what you provide? It can be tailored. However, you'd have to, um, we're willing to be flexible. However, 
our fee is kind of our fee is fixed, right? So it becomes an economic argument. Is it worthwhile for you to pay uh, eight percent to have garbage collected? You could probably find somebody to do garbage cheaper than NHS's fee plus the person doing the service. So that wouldn't make economic sense. Uh, you can call me, I'll happily do it. Um, but no, it wouldn't make, you know, that's the thing we point out. It, it wouldn't make sense for you to retain us to do this. It'll actually end up costing you more. Um, I see that uh, Musa Hassoun has their Hi. hand up. Hi. Yeah, um, I just had a quick question. Do you guys do um, provide this service to a small like condo or co-op buildings? Or is um, it just for like rentals where people are like uh, someone who owns the building and they're trying to rent out their unit? Okay, we only only small buildings. If If it's a small, if it's a four unit co-op or condo, we can do it. But if it's like a six or above unit co-op or condo, you can actually try, um, you can actually reach out to Fifth Avenue Committee. They own, they have a property management business for larger units. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, uh, to, yeah to, uh, to, to, to Isha, if no one has any comments, um, um, I'll be remiss. That, uh, I just wanted to just make everyone aware of our uh, Home Help for Heroes uh, grant, uh, home repair grant program for veterans. So if you don't mind, if no one has any further questions. I see, I see no more questions. So. But I do want to do a time check since there is another presenter. Okay. Understood. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good information. Greg. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the last agenda item for tonight. Um, uh, we uh, we have the great pleasure of having a planning fellow who will be joining us for uh, the remainder of this year. Uh, her name is Morgan Ruther. Um, she is a uh, graduate uh, student in uh, urban planning. She'll, she'll introduce herself in a minute, but um, the purpose of her uh, being with us for this year is to uh, perform some research for us. Um, and uh, her topic is related to the upcoming zoning test amendments, which we talked about before. So um, at this point, I will turn it over to Morgan. So please, uh, we, we welcome you uh, and uh, we are uh, very excited to hear more about your uh, your research that you intend to do for us uh, this year. So, uh, Morgan, take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks so much. Um, it's great to meet you all. Um, I'm going to also try and share my screen here, um, hopefully successfully. OK. Um, so, hi again, uh, my name is Morgan, um, and as Greg mentioned, I'm part of the Community Planning Fellowship Program uh, for the Fund for the City of New York, um, and I'm really excited to be working uh, with Brooklyn Community Board 14 uh, to look at the impacts of some of the upcoming zoning text amendments uh, that have been pr proposed under the City of Yes initiative. Okay, so a quick agenda of what I'm going to run through. I'm going to give um, a very brief background on the city of yes. Um, I'm going to share my uh, work plan for this project um, and then give an overview of some of the spe specific zoning proposals um, under the zoning for carbon neutrality piece of city of yes um, that I'm going to be looking at and throughout I welcome any and all feedback questions, um, you know, really looking to engage with everyone here. Um, so, as some of you may know, in June of this year, uh, Mayor Adams announced his administration's plan to implement new zoning tools uh, to support small businesses, create affordable housing, and promote decarbonization uh, throughout New York. 
Um, this is the plan known as um, City of Yes um, that is seeking to do all of this um, through three separate um, zoning reform initiatives. Uh, these are the three initiatives. Um, as I mentioned, one of these is zoning for carbon neutrality. Uh, the second is zoning for economic opportunity and then zoning for housing opportunity. Um, and the Dis Department of City Planning has announced a tentative timeline to initiate the process to certify these zoning changes. Uh, carbon neutrality will come first in, in early next year. Um, economic opportunity will follow in mid 2023 um, and then housing opportunity to come in late uh, to, or I'm sorry, early 2024. And for this reason, my project will focus on zoning for carbon neutrality as, as this is the most upcoming. Um, so a quick high level description of the project, I'll be looking at um, the potential local impacts of uh, some of the proposals under carbon neutrality um, and how it will affect community board 14. Um, it's maybe worth mentioning that uh, the Department of City Planning um, has implemented a more transparent um, process. Uh, than they have uh, when implementing previous zoning reforms. Um, so they've started hosting public information sessions and meeting with community boards and are taking you know, individual questions and comments. Um, so this project is really gonna seek to kind of take advantage of this opportunity to gather information ahead of time um, and provide the board with um, you know, research and, and resources that it can use to sort of um, provide input and uh, propose changes in advance of these proposals being uh, rolled out. Um, and so relatedly, the, the goals for this project are to kind of identify uh, which of these zoning changes are maybe most important to Community Board 14 or might have the biggest impact, um, identify where in the district these changes will occur and how, and again, to provide recommendations to inform the board's comments uh, to, to the Department of City Planning. Um, so this is a, ten sorry, there's a lot of text, um, but this is a tentative timeline for the project um, and a list of milestones so that we can really have a, a nice report ready to go um, by March of 2023. Um, and kind of focusing on today up here in the, the upper left, um, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the 17 zoning text amendments that are proposed under uh, zoning for carbon neutrality. Um, and I'd really like to open it up for discussion to kind of hear hear from the community about the community about which of these are most likely to be applicable um, moving forward. So uh, the Department of City Planning released some more details on these 17 text amendments under zoning for carbon neutrality. Um, these are all 17 of them. <laughs> There's a lot um, and they're sort of divided into four buckets. Uh, the proposals related to energy focus on solar and wind production. Uh, buildings focuses on changes uh, related to uh, facilitating retrofits. Uh, transportation covers parking regulations for electric vehicles. Um, and then lastly, there's waste and water, uh, which includes proposals for better um, stormwater management. Um, so again, there's a lot here. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I'd really like to narrow the scope of the project down to two or three of these and do a really detailed analysis on, you know, just a couple of them. Um, and, you know, in trying to think of a framework for how to narrow this focus, I took a look at you all's um, district needs assessment um, and the top three pressing issues um, that are listed there. Um, in particular, I think issues related to infrastructure resiliency seem to have a lot of overlap with some of the topics uh, covered in zoning for carbon neutrality. Um, so this includes issues of flooding, um, implementing electric vehicle charging stations and, and other infrastructure improvement and coordination concerns. Um, so some from this list that, that stood out to me is maybe being related to what's highlighted as some of um, the pressing needs uh, were these number 16 and 17. Uh, they both deal with uh, uh, proposals for uh, green infrastructure for stormwater management and flood mitigation. Uh, 16 proposes um, 
to make text amendments to allow for permeable paving. Uh, 17 proposes to modify street tree requirements uh, to incorporate uh, bioswales and rain gardens and connected tree beds. Um, also maybe relevant to concerns regarding electric vehicle charging. Um, DCP uh, uh, described how, um, you know, one of the issues they're focusing on is uh, electric vehicle owners not having places to charge their cars. Um, the 10th proposal here, um, uh, describe, uh, it proposes um, opening up the districts in which standalone charging stations are permitted. Uh, right now, they're only allowed in use group seven um, and, you know, potentially making those allowed in other districts. Um, 11 deals with, you know, whether charging stations have to be accessory or commercial, um, so relevant there. Um, and then two more that are maybe not covered specifically in the district needs assessment, but um, some of maybe stood out as more substantial reforms, um, looking at um, allowing for 100% rooftop solar coverage. Um, one in the building section uh, looks at preventing additional wall thickness from counting towards FAR. So there's there's a lot, there's a lot of different directions. Um, but but yeah, that's, you know, my, my goal for this presentation was just to sort of put these out there and hear everyone's thoughts. And, um, you know, I welcome any any questions and, um, you know, thoughts on any of these. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Um, yeah, I know it's it's quite <laughs> daunting to, to, to sort of try to uh, focus our attention on things that, um, you know, that may affect us the most. Because when I look at this list, I certainly see, you know, a couple of things that, um, you know, could could be of impact. I mean, transportation is, is always a big thing. I think in our in our district, in terms of trying to get places. I know we've heard uh, comments in some of our previous discussions of these text amendments that um, you know concerns about you know what are we doing with electric vehicles? How are they actually going to be um, you know accommodated, especially in a in a district as like ours? Um, so that, that that was one that certainly. Um, uh, left out at me, but I think what we certainly would like to do is hear from other folks who have or are listening this evening to see if there are any uh, any other thoughts based on uh, what we see here on the screen. And I see Glenn Woolen, um, uh, you have a question, so uh, so please, by all means. Hi. Um, yes, uh, I uh, a couple of things that I'm personally interested in, and that is. Uh, I have a Tesla, so I like the idea of being able to charge it now and then, you know, so it's not a big uh, uh, bookmark in my driveway. Um, so that, you know, I personally have a driveway, so I can plug it in, but I, I do think it's very important to get more uh, charging stations so more people can, in fact, especially if you're in a, an apartment building as opposed to a single house. Now, also, my roof is such that uh, I can't as yet put solar on it. There's not enough south facing area, especially with the existing regulations that you have to be in so many feet from the edges and so forth. So if that was uh, changed to this 100%, I might actually be able to put solar on the roof and I would like very much to be able to do that. So those are the two that I'm finding most interesting, but also we recently had something with DOT. We do a lot of flooding in the neighborhood and uh, this uh, number 16, permeable uh, paving, uh, seems to be the only one on this list that might address that. So I, I would be interested in finding out more about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, yeah, I mean, do we have any, um, I, I know we're awaiting more detailed text amendments, but I know Morgan, you had attended uh, sort of a discussion of, of these in, a little bit further detail. Is there anything yet in terms of uh, the the stormwater management, in, in terms of their thoughts on what um, you know, what kind of measures that they're thinking about, aside from uh, you know, sort of these general yeah. general uh, topics that we had so far? Yeah, I can actually pull up. Um, they've DCP has hosted a couple of public information sessions, but they also distributed a, a deck. Um, let me see. I think I have it open. Um, that you know it, it doesn't provide a ton more detail yeah i do have it open um let's see 
can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, so for example, um, they, you know, it's not a ton of additional information, um, but looking at the permeable surfaces example, um, you know, they talk about how there's ambiguity in the way that um, the the text is written right now, where it looks like the commissioner of buildings has to sign off um, on permeable paving um, being used in open parking areas. So. Um, you know, it says the text needs to be coordinated and potentially revised with DOB. So for each of these, there's um, a little bit more detail. Um, this is kind of the the extent of my my knowledge. But my next step on on my work plan is to kind of actually arrange a meeting with DCP. They're taking one on one meetings. Um, so any questions that we have um, or any you know additional information, I can jot some notes down and, and take that back to them. Uh, Sean, I think you have your hand raised and might be able to speak to this a little bit more. Yeah, just to tease it out, and this is unfair because I have I have access to Morgan all the time. But but um, I just piggybacking off of that, having seen the 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 uh, DEP presentation and then looking at how um, limited DCP um, um, is at, at this time, just want to note that this isn't. We don't necessarily only have to react to what DCP is putting into the amendment, we could be proactive about suggesting that they tear down the silos and sort of like, you know, coordinate with some of the proposals from other agencies that are working on resiliency and that sort of thing. And, and the DEP cloudburst and uh, rainfall ready programs are great examples of things that just could be woven in. It seems pretty neatly. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right there. And, and I think uh, my, my question is in terms of you know how how to target it for for district needs. Do we have any sort of mapping in terms? I know we've 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 heard a lot about you know the problem areas in the in the district where you know flooding occurs and and and, and we do have those issues. Do, is that you know um, do do we have that um, you know mapping in terms of where those targeted areas could be part of this as well? We don't have a physical. We we haven't gone through the steps of putting on a physical map, we have the locations, they've been turned into DEP, but something that Morgan and I have talked about is the extent to which some of these things, you know, some of the findings of the report, once we drill down on what, what you're looking for to find, um, um, are mappable. Um, okay. So, but but it's, you know, it, it, it wouldn't, it, it's only five locations, so it seems like we could map it and maybe do some overlays with um, where the zoning then would impact and just see if zoning changes would actually affect those areas or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, we have a few more questions done. We'll get back to you in a moment, but Talisha, uh, why don't we, uh, uh, we'll uh, proceed with your question first. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, Morgan, if you could uh, just quickly uh, clarify. Um, so at the beginning of the slides, uh, you had some dates coming up uh, in 2023. Uh, you know, for what I guess, uh, you know, the city has on the docket. Uh, and then you put up a list of three things that were in the district statements of needs. Uh, um, and I'm just wondering, um, because you just said that DCP is offering um, one on one, you know, like uh, sessions. Uh, in order to be able to, you know, tell them, <laughs> ask them some questions and, and clarify things. I'm just wondering how those sort of three things uh, go together. So uh, Nina Sabgir uh, put in the comments that, uh, you know, about it not being able to install a proper outlet to charge um, uh, her electric vehicle. Uh, and Glenn Rowland just spoke about how he was able to, uh, he's able to charge his vehicle, but he's got another problem with, uh, you know, solar panels on his roof. Uh, so for him, the electric vehicle is not, you know, charging is not crazy, <laughs> but for Nina it is. Uh, so where do all of these things sort of fall in line with? the dates that are coming up, uh, you know, in 2023 and with the conversations with DCP and with the district statement of needs. 
Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, the the district statement of needs. You know, I was kind of using. I don't know where I, that maybe is the first thing on the timeline. I was sort of using that as a reference, like what are the issues that already exist? Um, just for my, you know, as sort of an outsider, what what can I kind of look to to kind of get at least a little bit of background on what what the priorities might be um, within this district? Um, I think the next, then you know, after this meeting, the next the next bullet on the timeline is to meet with DCP um, and you know, try and get a little bit more information um, on some of these and, and, you know, flesh out a little bit more what's in the information that they've provided. Um, I noted that the, you know, car, uh, zoning for carbon neutrality um, is supposed to sort of get rolling in early 2023, potentially March. Um, so my, my plan um, is to, you know, hopefully have this project completed or mostly completed ahead of that um, so that you all kind of have this, you know, all this information that you need to kind of, um, you know, provide comments to DCP and, you know, alternatives and recommend, you know, liaising with DEP um, sort of ahead of this more formal review process starting. Um, does that get to your, to the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, okay. you know, basically we're looking at um, March for getting uh, together what this district finds most important in terms of the carbon neutrality. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a few more questions here. I know uh, we'll get to yours in the second part in as well. Uh, Glenn, we'll, uh, I think you were next in one, so please. Thank you. Uh, two questions, um, Morgan. Number three, ESS. What does that stand for? Oh, <laughs> what does it? St I know what it is. Hang on, I can pull it out. ESS is the energy generation boxes. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a slow. Oops, not too far. Okay. ESS. It doesn't say, but um, <laughs> they okay. they um, they generate electricity. Um, that is then uh, All right. Well, that's something that distributed back yeah, into the grid specifically, and also in number ten, when it says level three charging, um, that means something very specific, and I'd like to know what it what that is. I believe that level three charging refers to standalone charging stations, um, which right now are only permitted in East Group Seven, so only in a couple commercial areas. Um, well, that's yeah. not correct. Oh, okay. uh, I'm not to say what you just said is not correct, but level three has to do with the rate of charging and has to do with the amount of amps that are pushed into your vehicle. Um, so right now, level three is what Tesla superchargers are, but this may mean something different. So those will do up to 72 amps. Now, level two charging tends to be around 30 amps, which is what I have in my house. So um level one charging is standard 110 but i'd like to know specifically what it is they're referring to um because right now only teslas can uh, plug into superchargers but there are a lot of other vehicles that are coming onto the streets that cannot plug into those superchargers and i like to know uh what will be coming available for them so gotcha. that's it thank you very much Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I think you're correct, uh, um, Sean, that e ESS means energy storage system. It's a battery uh, storage system that I think they use generally for um, outages or surge events, that sort of thing. So you'll always have it in reserve or to, to hold, they also are coming online as well to hold, um, to hold excess uh, electricity um, available 
So in those instances, when there are greater needs, the, the electricity would be available. Um, okay, uh, next question is uh, Melissa Minich, please. That's right, it's, it's Minich, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, I just just wanted to, to put out there, I, I know there is a lot of different potential priorities um, in these four different categories. And at least my, my take on some of these, at least, it seems like we're really zeroing in on electric cars and solar panels, which I can tell you at least where I live and then, you know, the rent stabilized side in, in Flatbush. This is not something that really any of my neighbors, myself at least, there, there are no, no electric cars and solar panels would not be put on this building. My, my building is actually, they're carving up some, some units to create more rent stabilized units. It's illegally, that's what's happening here. Um, so I would actually, for myself and others who live on this side of our, our district, really like to highlight um, some of the transportation pieces here about um, like number 13, shortcomings in bike parking regulations and accommodating other micromobility options. I think that some of these other pieces are very important that we focus on as well. And certainly the um, issues with pavement, flooding, all of that. I mean, I think figuring out solutions that are good for our entire district and that will benefit everybody who lives here in a, a public, a very public way and that everyone can benefit from, not individuals in as much of a way. I yeah, know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think we, what we're trying to do is to sort of pinpoint those, uh, those topics that are important. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think that's a valuable comment to make sure that, um, you know, especially from a transportation perspective, we're, um, you know, looking at the needs of, uh, you know, across the district to make sure that they're addressed. So uh, Morgan, I think we'll, we'll definitely make that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely make that uh, a, uh, a priority as well. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'll go back to Barden's question. Uh, from earlier from the chat. Um, question was, uh, what's your take, Morgan, on the breadth of this and the following amendments? They seem pretty dramatic to me, uh, you know, from the perspective of that there are a lot of significant changes in a, in a, in a short period of time. So um, I know you'd mentioned sort of the historic in terms of process, um, in terms of, um, I guess, the history in terms of what, what the scale of these uh, text amendments are. Is this Sort of unprecedented is it is it something in your eyes that um you know maybe they're biting off too much more than they than they can chew here but uh what, what, what's your thoughts on that yeah i mean i i i you know i'll definitely say i'm not an expert on any of these um topics you know there's a lot of this is very technical um and that's one of my you know hopes for picking a few is to actually kind of be able to to dig deeper into them um, in terms of scale of the initiative, you know, I think when I was initially looking at this, the last kind of batch of zoning text amendments, I believe was the five that were passed in, was it 2019? Um, and, you know, when I first started this project, I was sort of thinking, you know, oh, these are, this is three zoning text amendments, but looking at, you know, what this really is, and it's 17, plus, you know, another two, um, two batches, you know, to be determined how many that are. I mean, you know, my initial reaction is that it, it's quite significant. Um, if you're looking at five versus, you know, five in one year versus potentially 30, 40 um, in the span of one year, um, it, it seems quite significant to me. But again, you know, I'm not sure, you know, maybe this has happened before, but not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> sure, sure. Sean, if uh, you want to weigh in as well. Yeah, just to, re just to remind the board that um, when the five zoning text amendments that uh, came up most recently were 
they were announced to community boards at the same time that they were certified, which which meant that they came to us with the clock already ticking. So one of the differences with with these three text amendments, as it, despite the fact that they're denser, they've been shared at a sort of nascent stage with with boards across New York City prior to being certified. And I don't even think this one is going to, um, I don't think city planning is gonna certify it until, I don't know, Morgan and Greg, Talisha, maybe you remember more specifically, but you know, it's not until sometime in, in February or, or something like that this winter. Um, so the fact that they came to us in September about something that was, you know, they're just giving a, a much longer lead time, um, which gave us the opportunity to apply for a planning fellow, which is awarded by the Fund for the City of New York, who can sort of tease it out before the, the board has to actually weigh in on it. So um, it is more, but the process is extended in a way that I think is is uh, is positive. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you for sure. Um, it's, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's, it is an enormous project and it will be ongoing. So, you know, I think um, in this phase of it, certainly we appreciate having Morgan on board here to help us uh, navigate through it. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, uh, you know, get to these key district, um, you know, needs and, and connect, um, you know, effectively so that, um, you know, we can have our voice heard on the, uh, on the, on the topics that, and the, uh, amendments that are going to be most, uh, important to us. Um, all right. I, I'm just looking to see if there are any other further questions at this point, by the way, hopefully we answered, answered Barton's question. I hope we did, uh, with, with that response. So, um, I, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, we, we, we could leave it here, but I just like to sort of sum up and, and, and see, you know, and, and ask for everyone um, who participated tonight, if there are any other comments to uh, to certainly um, to, to forward those along so we can continue to uh, um, hone this down um, to our, uh, you know, to, to, to our scope for, uh, for Morgan. Um, Sean, is there any other direction we want to give at this point, you know, to everybody to, to, to help, uh, you know, with this project? Not from me, Morgan. I don't know if if it if it helped sort of zero in or or just demonstrated how wide open it could be. Um, so if you have anything you want to say to try to um, sum up anything you want to zero in on, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely want to kind of you know look. I've been kind of taking notes here on the side. Look through everything again. Um, I really appreciate all the all the input um, and. I'm happy to drop my my information um, in the chat if anyone has any follow up thoughts or wants to shoot you know articles or you know anything um, the, the, please feel free um, but I appreciate it and um, you know hopefully you can take everyone's comments um, into account as we sort of narrow narrow the scope down um, but but yeah thank you again. Okay, thank, well, thank you, you for, for all of your initiative and your, your hard work already. And, you know, you called yourself an outsider, but I think you've, you're already pretty steeped in the community. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So with that, I know we're, uh, you know, in the interest of time check, uh, it's been a great meeting, everybody. Um, I think we'll leave it there for now. So um, thanks again for everyone's participation. Um, we'll uh, recap at the next uh, uh, monthly meeting and hopefully we'll, We'll continue these conversations that we uh, that we started today. So thank you all. Uh, before, yeah, Talisha, was there anything else? I'm sorry before we uh, before we drop off. No, you got it all. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks, everybody. Have thank a good you. night. Good night, everybody. For those I don't see, happy holidays too. Happy holidays. <laughs> Have a happy holiday. Very, very, very informative. And healthy holiday. Happy holidays. Bye. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays. <laughs>